the last time, we left off with the idea of false personality keeping us in the dark about ourselves so that essentially we have no real picture of who and what we are. What we have instead is a photograph that has been airbrushed, retouched, photoshopped, whatever you'd like to say. We can make something look like almost anything we want. If you've ever seen one of these exposés they do on television from time to time on the advertising industry and how they'll take a photo session of a model and then they'll change it. They get in, they'll take a picture. Okay, we're going to use this picture. And these are things that they really do. They actually lengthen the legs of the model. No matter, I don't care how long her legs are. They actually lengthen the legs and then they do this and then they do that. They start to do all these things that actually change the anatomy of the person. I guess, in a sense, to look more like a Barbie doll, which if a Barbie doll is proportioned out, exploded out, expanded to look like a real person. So if a real person were standing next to you who was made out of the, the proportions of a Barbie doll, next to a human being. It would be ludicrous. Yet, to our minds, we accept all of this as this idyllic standard of beauty, which has nothing whatsoever to do with reality. So in a very real sense, what the false personality does with us is it gives us a Photoshop, an airbrush, so that we can take whatever pictures that we collect of ourselves throughout our life, and we can Photoshop them. We can airbrush them. We can remove all the blemishes. We can change things. And in the construct of what we're doing, everything fits. Whereas if we took it outside and put it in the reality of day, the light of day, it wouldn't work at all. It would be ludicrous. It would be grotesque. In order to have Barbie for her legs to be as long as they are compared to everything else, she would have to be like nine feet tall. If you start putting things in proportion, you take one part of her and put everything else in proportion with that, she'd be like this giant, like this nine or ten foot tall woman. And there we are. This is where we're at. If we were to take any part of us that all looks fine when we photoshopped it all together and put it next to a standard of reality and put everything proportionate to that, we would have to be like Mother Teresa or Jesus Christ or Mahatma Gandhi or a Buddha or I don't know. We'd have to be this incredible person that we're not. And then if you take Gandhi or, or one of these other people, or Mother Teresa, and then you Photoshop her, take the Photoshopped image that we have, because that's what we have, and you put that in reality, it's like, oh, well, wait a second, that was just a normal person after all. But we do this because we don't like the competition. We don't like Mother Teresa and Gandhi. I mean, we like to hold them up as special people, but not people that we could ever be. That's why Christianity is so mystical and important to people. Because Jesus is this wonderful God figure, but it's not anything you're expected to be. Oh, well, you can't be like that. He was like us in every way, except he was without sin, is how the story goes. But you're not, so therefore you can't be like that. Yet his whole message is, well, you've got to be like this. That's just not fair because you were immaculately conceived, so there was a virgin birth, and you were born perfect, and blah, blah, blah. That's just not fair. But see, all of that legend, all of that mysticism has grown up around the figure of a human being who, if he is telling you to do something that you can't do, deserves to be crucified, but not risen. If Buddha is telling you to do something that you cannot do, that is not an option for you, he deserves to be burned at the stake or whatever. But the very fact that these people are asking you to do something that is possible for you, that's a difficult one because now we have to make effort. And if you've got to make effort, a religion isn't going to last very long because it's going to put the responsibility, the ability to respond to the message squarely on your individual shoulders, and that's where people draw the line. No. I can ride the bus, I can be in the train, I can be in the plane, and it's going to heaven. It's going to nirvana. It's going to the promised land. But I can't do it myself. I have to be on the bus or the plane or the train or in the car. No, that's not what these people taught. That's not what these people were about. These people were about taking this image, these pictures that you have of yourself, and bringing them into the light and seeing just where you need to make improvements. 
and then to make the improvements, to take the steps necessary. But we don't want it to be that way. We want it to be, no, you make the improvements for me. I'm willing to lie down here on the altar and give myself as a sacrifice. Now you fix me. I'm willing to go to the plastic surgeon and have him do the surgery. But you do the surgery. I can't do the surgery. But you see, all of these methods, all of these ways, all of this esoteric teaching is about one thing. It's about, no, you have to do it. You need to make the effort. We can direct you. We can give you guidance. We can help you. But we can't do it for you. So the false personality keeps us in the dark about ourselves, having no real picture of what we are, just for this purpose. If you never know what you are, you never can work on it. If you think you're in Philadelphia, you'll never get to New York City if you're really in Los Angeles. Because you'll keep traveling north to go from Philadelphia to New York, but you'll keep end up being in San Francisco or Seattle or Nome, Alaska. It just doesn't work. So you'll have to know where you are. Otherwise, the directions don't make any sense. Otherwise, the directions will take you somewhere else. So the very first thing that's necessary is we've got to have the pictures of ourselves start to be more real. The practical object of this work is to let a ray of light into our inner world of pictures. Where this work gets practical, where it stops being theoretical, where it stops being philosophical, is when it comes to letting some light into our world of pictures, the pictures that we have of ourselves. And these pictures that we have of ourselves are mostly lies. They're mostly false. They're always incredibly exaggerated. They always are missing big pieces, or they'll have other pieces painted in over reality, photoshopped in, to make us look some way other than the way we are. And it makes it impossible for us to do anything. What is the result of this light? The result of it is seeing parts of us, the parts of us that are in darkness, and bringing them into consciousness, bringing them into our own consciousness. Oh, well, that really doesn't sound very pleasant. Well, it's not very pleasant which is exactly why it's so difficult to do, because it is so unpleasant, is so contradictory to our feeling of ourself. We're all reasonable, nice people. For me to have a bad day, I have to be provoked in an unnatural way by a lot of other people and things and events, because I am just naturally a wonderful, easygoing person, just like you. But if we go back to when we were children, and our mothers or fathers would say of us, Jennifer's mother said, well, you're a melancholy. What did your father say of you, Jess? I was a horse's ass. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess everybody has their own way of expressing it. Matt? What did my dad say about me? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you picked what did my dad say of you. Hey. That was your choice. Okay. I was my dad's favorite, so he was always like, you know, you're wonderful and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the big shock to you is when we, the rest of us don't agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But you see how it's starting to shape up now? Now, what about your mother? My mom was not real expressive. So, you know. You have no idea what she thought of you. No. I have very little idea. And does anybody believe that? No, I don't believe that at all either. I think that what he did is he just blocked that out completely because it, what his dad thought of him, he was his dad's favorite, so therefore he must be wonderful. Anything else just doesn't even belong in the picture. It doesn't make it to the photo album. But did she have no opinion? <laughs> Does a mother have no opinion about their son? No. It's just not that way. But it's interesting that he gives us this perfect example of how we can just block out entire pictures that don't belong. Well, this doesn't belong in my photo album. Okay, let's say you go to a photo shoot. You go to a photo shoot. Let's say I hire the world's greatest professional photographer who is an expert at making plain Janes or John Doe's look like, wow. And I hire this person, and you have all day, a whole eight-hour session with this person. And their film is not the problem. They're going to take as many thousands of pictures as they care to take. And you then get to go through all of those pictures after they're developed and pick out the ones that you'll keep. What are you going to pick out? Oh, I don't like that one. That's a, it makes my nose look big. Well, I'm not with that one. I blinked on that one. Look at I never. My eyes are always open. I never blink. Do you understand what I'm saying now? This is what we actually would do in life, isn't it? We would go through and we would pick out the ones that made us look the best. What makes us think that we don't do that with this internal photo gallery, this internal set of pictures that we have? That's exactly what we do. The result of letting light in, in a work sense, self-observation, unidentified self-observation, proper self-observation, is that we start to see all the pictures that we called. Like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I look like. 
Why did you throw that out? Well, because that's not me. That's not what I look like. That doesn't make me look good. So this feeling of self that we have begins to change as we let light in. And at first, it is so unpleasant that we resist it. Some people resist it strongly. Other people don't resist it as strongly. It depends on your personality type. There are some strong personalities, and there are some personalities that are not quite as strong. I think we all recognize that in life. We look at people, and we find people who are very opinionated. I don't care what you say, they've got an opinion about it. And then there are other people who are like, mm, whatever, they just want to be left alone. Now, those are the two extremes, the two opposites, but we fall somewhere in that range as a rule. But as we begin to see more, as we let more light in, our feeling of self begins to change. We get a more whole idea of who we are. And as I say, at first, that's a very unpleasant thing. We don't like that because the very things that we've been leaving out, we've left out because we didn't like feeling that way. I don't want to feel that way. So therefore, I call those out. I don't want to look that way. So therefore, I, I call those pictures out. But this work is about collecting them all because they serve a purpose of giving us the opportunity to see a whole picture of ourselves more of ourselves. And if we can become aware of that and start to put our feeling of I in that, we become a more whole person. In the work language, man number one has his center of gravity in the instinctive moving center. Man number two has his center of gravity in the emotional center. And man number three has his center of gravity in the intellectual center. You all know this backward and forward in your sleep, probably. There are also six formulations of man from this angle, as Connie pointed out to us in her presentation Wednesday night. There's man number one, two, three. There's man number one, three, two. There's man number two, three, one. There's man number two, one, three. There's man number three, one, two. And there's man number three, two, one. So these are the six formulations that can occur if we look at it. So what does that really mean? What that means is that man number one, two, three, his first predominant center of gravity is in the instincts and the movements. And then more rarely, he is in his emotional perception. And then even rarer still, he is in intellectual thoughts. So predominantly, where he spends most of his time, where his center of gravity is, the deepest indentation that he will always kind of slope down into, just like water seeks its own level. So he has like three indentations. The one is the deepest, two is the next deepest, and three is the least deep. So where the water is going to run, where his center of gravity will be, is in one, instincts and movements. He'll be there mostly. Then he'll have some emotional perceptions, and then he'll have some intellectual thoughts, but not nearly as many as instincts and movements. So he's really heavy in that area. So his center of gravity is there. He is unbalanced man. He is one-sided man. What is the dark side of him? Well, intellect. The intellectual thoughts is the dark side of him. In other words, there is a side of him that's in the light the instincts and the movements, he's very aware of that, very aware of that, very alert in that area. His emotional perceptions, not so much. His intellectual thoughts, even less. So he relies mostly on instincts and movements. Then he relies on emotional perceptions, and least of all, he relies on the intellectual thoughts because they are the least trustworthy to him because of his center of gravity. Not because of anything about these centers, but because of his center of gravity, one thing is more trustworthy than another. Steve is left-handed. Tammy is left-handed. I'm right-handed. Their strong hand is their left hand. My weak hand is my left hand. That doesn't mean that left hands are weak or left hands are strong or right hands are weak or right hands are strong. It simply means that their center of gravity is in their left hand. So their strength is in their left hand. Whereas my center of gravity is in my right hand, so therefore my strength is there. And my weakness, or the darker side, is the left. What's in the dark about him, what's the dark side about him, is what is undeveloped, not yet conscious, sides two and three, the emotional and intellectual life. Here's man number one, two, three. And of course, all of them, all the formulations are the same way. Man number two, three, one, whatever it is, they're all the same way. What is in darkness, that of which we are not conscious, for whatever reason, and that which seems so strange and foreign and untrustworthy to us, because it has not been brought into the light, or the light has not been brought to it. So it is with each of the formulations. That which lies in darkness may take many undesirable automatic manifestations. When you don't know what's going on with it, it can do almost anything. 
how would you possibly know? All of the mechanical automatic manifestations, well not all of them, but most of them are going to come out of the areas where we are most in darkness. This makes sense, yes? yes. One of many forms of the swing of the pendulum for us may be between the more developed side of us, the light side, and the less developed side of us, the dark side. So here we have someone who's man number one, two, three. He is instincts and movements. That's the light side of him. But over here is intellectual thought. That's the dark side of him, his intellectual world. So he swings from here to here, from light to darkness. What is that going to do? Well, that's going to make a Jekyll and Hyde is what it's going to do. It's going to make somebody who is this one moment and that the next moment. Do you know anybody like that? Hopefully you know yourself. Hopefully you know you are like that. Yes, you are like that. So if you answered me, I am like that, then you've been observing yourself. The task becomes observing, noticing, bringing into the light of our own consciousness this dark side. Why? Just to irritate ourselves. That's the main reason. Just to annoy ourselves, to provoke ourselves. No. The main reason is to educate it. It can be educated. Just like the side that you now have was educated. Where your center of gravity is, was educated. You weren't born with that. This is all part of false personality. This is all part of what you acquired in life. So you may have had a certain proclivity, propensity for certain things based on your essence. But then in life, we become less and less balanced, more and more unbalanced, by relying more and more on what we do well and less and less on what we don't do well. What kind of sports did you play in school? Oh, I played all the sports I hated and was terrible at. <laughs> what kind of clubs were you? I was in all the clubs that I just hated the most. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's not how life works. That's not what we do. And if it is what we do, then we find our center of gravity in something equally as unbalanced as doing what we like to do all the time. Well, I always do what I don't like. There's no difference between always doing what you don't like and always doing what you like. There's no difference. It's the same thing. You're still unbalanced. Our task then becomes bringing it into the light of our own consciousness and educating it. This results in inner growth, the development of the person, the harmonious development of the person, the harmonious development of man, the harmonious development of who you are, the harmonious development of what you could become. Isn't that what you want? The harmonious development? You don't want an insane, frenetic development. Two oxen yoked together pull the cart. Two oxen not yoked together, one goes this way, the other goes that way, and the cart's, uh, and you have trouble. So we yoke them together, a harmonious development. We've got to bring things together first. This work is about a harmonious development. This dark side into which the work tells us to send the light can be both good and bad. It's so in our collective unconscious that the dark is bad, that we are afraid of the dark. We fight the dark. The dark is the evil. The dark is the enemy. And it's not that way. Treasure is often hidden in a dark place. Some of the most precious gems on earth come from deep, deep in the dark recesses of the earth. Why is that? Well, because that's where they are. And there are some very fine qualities that you have that are hidden in the dark. But until you bring the light to those dark areas, you won't find them. You go without them. You go without those riches. You go without that harmony. You go without those blessings, as it were. Because you're afraid that there's something bad down there. And there is something bad down there. But it's not all bad. There is good, too. Pictures are always bad. Why is that? Because they're pictures. Well, what's good, then? What's so? The truth about you is always better than any picture of you. Because it's closer to your goal. What is your goal? Man, know thyself. Your goal is to know yourself. You know a picture of yourself, well, you know yourself. Pictures are always bad because they don't lead you to the reality, the truth about yourself. They can always be doctored. They can always be photoshopped. They can always be fixed. They can always fade. They can always be crumpled, wrinkled. Something can always happen to them. Undeveloped functions are only bad if they're left in the dark. You've got all these undeveloped functions, all these things inside of you that are bad if they're left in the dark because they remain undeveloped because they remain potential. What good is potential? It's like having a Swiss bank account with a billion dollars in it, a numbered Swiss bank account with a billion dollars in it. And without the number, you starve to death. Without the number, you're a pauper. Without the number, you have nothing. You may as well not have the billion dollars. Well, that's what these functions that are hidden in the darkness, that's what they're like. 
They're like numbered Swiss bank accounts. Or they're like what's in the numbered Swiss bank account. If brought forward through observation, they add meaning, they add impressions, they bring interests into your life. You find something in the darkness and it gives you the opportunity to become more whole. Is that going to enable you to get more impressions from life? You bet it is. And what is the food that we have to have all the time? The food of impressions. We must have impressions in order to survive. We can go without physical food for quite some time. We can go without air for some time. We can't go without impressions at all. If you are not having impressions for a nanosecond, you're dead. Impressions is what makes life for you. How you know that you exist is impressions. If you can imagine life without impressions, what have you imagined? Well, it's just an impression, I'll guarantee you that. Whatever it is, it's an impression. You can't not have impressions. This is what the work teaches. When all of this starts to happen, you have this added meaning, these added impressions, this added interest in life by finding these things that are hidden in the dark, on the dark side of you, in the darkness of you. Your feeling of yourself begins to change. Let's go back to man number one, two, three. Man number one, two, three. He has a center of gravity and instincts and movements. Then the next, he has something in emotional perceptions. Then least, he has something in intellectual thought. Let's go back to him. The one-sided man, the unbalanced man. Remember him? The one-centered man. He feels himself in a certain way, doesn't he? Instincts, movements. That's how he feels himself. That's how he knows who he is. That's how he relates to everything. That's how he touches the world. That's how the world touches him. Yes, you agree? So let's say he goes into the darkness of himself. Self-observation, he starts shining a light in there. Without identifying, he begins to see all this other richness of the intellectual center. And he finds that he has an intellectual center, that he is able to operate there, that he has an emotional center, and that he's able to operate there. He brings those things into a harmonious development, a harmonious picture, at first, of himself. And when he does that, does his feeling of himself change? Oh, yes. It changes radically. It's a lot like finding out you won the lottery. Would your feeling of yourself change? Oh, yes. Oh, no, my feeling of myself wouldn't change. Right. You now have $80 million. What are you going to do with it? Oh, nothing. I'm just going to ignore it. I don't even want to collect it. Uh-huh. How long is that going to last? Well, it's about over now, I think. Your feeling of yourself changes. I now feel richer. What does it mean? I can do things that I couldn't do before. That's what it means. That's what it means. Your feeling of yourself changes. I now can do things that I couldn't do before. Well, if you look in this darkness and you find out if you're man number one, two, three, you find out you've got three, you've got two, strong. You can do things you couldn't do before. Your whole feeling of yourself begins to change. As other centers come forward, he loses his former feeling. This is the rub for a lot of people. A lot of people despair at this point. They start to lose what they were so familiar with, where their real center of gravity was, and they panic. Or they just dig their heels in and resist. A lot of people stop right there. At best, it's uncomfortable. At worst, it's a total panic. I'm losing myself. But at best, it's very uncomfortable. It can be extremely uncomfortable. Oh, well. As I think I've said before, this work is not about being comfortable. The problem is the devil is always the dark side, that of which we are ignorant. By refusing to learn about ourselves, in a sense, we become devil worshippers, don't we? All deference is given to the darkness. Oh, don't go there. It was like when I was a child, my paternal grandparents lived in the house that my father grew up in. And, you know, out here in California, that's unheard of. Well, there's a house that old. <laughs> yeah, there are. But it's unheard of to us because we don't really have those kinds of roots. But... The house that he grew up in is the house that they lived in till they died. They had two places you didn't go. Upstairs to the middle room. Nobody wanted to go into that room. And downstairs to the basement. Now, if you were a child, you didn't want to go in the basement. Adults could go in the basement. But adults didn't go up to the middle room upstairs. It was haunted. That was the story. But the kids didn't go down in the basement. Because that was just like dark and scary. So the children essentially ended up becoming devil worshippers. What we worshipped, what we revered, what we honored above all else was that basement. We could go anywhere in the house, but we wouldn't go there. 
That was the Holy of Holies. Do you see my point? How we become devil worshippers by avoiding our dark side? We worship ignorance. We worship everything strict. We worship everything narrow. We worship everything unmerciful. And that's really what we're doing. If you look at your life, look at what I've been asking you to do over all of these years. We're coming up to four years, aren't we, in this? Four years in this, this specific line of work. I've been asking you to do things that I've never asked you to do before. Never asked any of you before to go to a 10-day meditation course and go sit for 10 hours a day for 10 days straight and do nothing but meditate, eat food that somebody else prepares for you, sleep place that someone else prepared for you, and do nothing except meditate. You all did it. We have three people coming back today who just finished a second and a third time going. It's a strange request to make of people, of a group of people. And I made a lot of strange requests. But there was something inside of you that said, well, it's a strange request, but I think there's benefit to it. I think there's something that I could learn. I think there's something I could find out about me. Or I think there's something I could find out about life that would make me better. And so people did it. Not once, but twice as a rule. And some three times. And some, the hardcore, four times. I've asked you to become more compassionate. In order to grow, in order to unfold, you have to change. You're going to have to lose your current sense of self. You're going to have to die to yourself. That's an unpleasant proposition for most of us. We don't want to do that. Agreed? And so we resist. And I say, okay, the amount of resistance that you're experiencing is the amount of misery that you're going to have in your life. So what you resist persists, so you get to stay that way. But you also get to multiply your own misery. Because resistance is painful. You do know that. It's painful. It's what causes discomfort. Discomfort, uncomfortableness, is from our resistance. If you stop resisting, the discomfort may not go away, but it's not as uncomfortable when you're not resisting. A pain is a pain is a pain. You resist that pain, and it multiplies the pain. It makes it worse. It adds other centers to it. 